All right, welcome everyone to another in our series of Walter Rodney Lectures here at the African Studies Center at the Party School at Boston University. I'm Mark Storella, I'm the director of the center, and we are very excited today to have um, as our speaker, Oladele Ayurinde. Um, Dr. Ayurinde is going to uh, take us in a direction that we are very eager to go here at ASC to expand our cultural uh, interaction uh, as we study African issues. And there's no doubt that um, that the invitation to Dr. Ayurinde no doubt uh, had its beginnings with Eric Schmidt, who is himself an ethnomusicologist. Well, I will say that um, Michael Bierenbaum Quintero, chair of musicology, had suggested yes, uh, Dr. Ayurinde, so that as well. Okay, the team great. effort. So, Boladele um, Ayurinde is a visiting assistant professor of ethnomusicology at the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology at Indiana University. Boladele uh, is also a research fellow of the African Open Institute for Music Research and Innovation at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. He was a 2022 THINK postdoctoral fellow. And THINK, uh, I guess we should, all postdoctoral fellows should be THINK postdoctoral fellows, but this one has special meaning, transforming the humanities through interdisciplinary knowledge at the Department of Anthropology and Wintz School of Arts at the University of Witzwatersan in South Africa. Uh, Oladeli was also an, is this correct, Engelander Music Fellow? Yeah, I so. yeah. Um, and lecturer at the Department of Musicology Sound Studies at the University of Bonn in Germany in 2022. Um, he's, his ongoing research agenda is entitled Music, Agency, and Social Transformation. So no small issues here. We're going for the whole thing. Um, and it explores the nexus between music human agency, and the political economy of everyday life in Africa and in the African diaspora. He's working on two book projects right now. I'm sure that's complicated. I'm just keeping the footnotes in the right place must be difficult to have two going at once, but there it is. Uh, situated at the intersections of economic, ethnomusicology, anthropology, and African history, Dr. Ayurinde's work in progress uh, includes a monograph that explores the political economy of Fuji music. Is that the correct translation? Yeah. And everyday life in Lagos, Nigeria. And there's a lot of everyday life going on in Lagos, Nigeria. So that's a big study as well. Uh, Fuji is a Nigerian urban popular music genre that mixes Yoruba poetic idioms, drumming, Islamic cantillations, and aesthetic resources from Juju High Life and uh, Euro American pop music. His second book project explores the political and uh, politics and economy of racial and social justice and their practical implications for discourse around transformation and decolonization in South Africa. Building on his initial research on the fallist movements and uh, drawing cases from an ongoing ethnomusicological practice led action research in Black communities and public facing academic initiatives in Johannesburg and Cape Town. This project aims to reconceptualize discourse around racial and social justice and transformation in post-1994 South Africa. And today's lecture is entitled, When We Sing, Everyone Hears. And, um, and you're going to be focusing a great deal on musicking in the African uh, post-colonial period. And with that, I'm uh, enthused to turn the microphone over to Professor Ayurinde. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thanks, for, uh, thanks everyone for coming. It's nice seeing you all. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm happy to be here. And it's nice seeing also our colleagues online. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. I can see Daniel Reed, my, uh, one of my hosts and my amiable mentor at the uh, University of uh, Indiana University. Thanks, Daniel, for joining us. Yeah. So 
my presentation is um, as um, ambassador just explained, it's from a, uh, an ongoing work in South Africa. Uh, and not the entire but from my entire you know, project around social transformation and agency and everyday life in uh, Africa. So the idea about this project is simply to conceptualize the idea of uh, the common, the humanity, and particularly what that means for uh, understanding ideas around social justice. Yeah. So I won't take too much of your time. I'm just going to get into the process. But uh, by a way of warning, in quotes, uh, the I have, we have some some graphics here are quite problematic and they could be troubling. So I just want you to know about that we have some serious. It's called everyday life. So <laughs> everyday life, we have some graphics that are quite uh, terrifying. You know, but the essence is simply to make a case uh, and open the conversation to all of us. Then in sum, I think uh, this is an ongoing work. I am looking forward uh, to your contribution, your uh, question, and ways in, in which your positions or advice can help the work progress in the right direction. So thank you so much. So I'll start, um, let's say, with An event. Everything is story. She wants to know that I think said. So we want the date. We want the date. We want the date. It was a huge singing. Students chanted vigorously as they arrived at the Bremner, uh, Bremner building. Slide one, please. Slide one. Mm -hmm. The, the Brenner Building, the administrative office of the University of Cape Town, um, and the admin office for the University of Cape Town, and the office of the vice chancellor, located at the lower, at the, at the middle campus of the university. It was around 2 p.m. on March 20, 2015. The third week of the Rose Must Fall protest, and the second day of the Occupy Brenner, student demand was an urgent remover of Ceci Road, Ceci John Road statue, which was comfortably seated at the uh, art of the university. It seems to it seems students that uh, that the UCT vice chancellor at the time, Matt Price, and the university's management were lagging or ignoring the call for the urgent removal of the statue. What seemed like a performance, a stage performance comments and echoes of shouting, singing, dancing in cycle and ululation fill the surroundings of the building. As the songs and ululation crescent, the sound of the music traveled across the lower and the middle campus of UCT. Other students who heard the music from afar quickly found their ways to the protest ground. As the performance gathered momentum, Tando, a member of the Student Representative Council, SRC, stepped into the open space of the circle. She introduced new dancers, and everyone followed her lead as she moved forth and back in stately dance steps. Everyone followed her lead, and it became um, an intense performance. As she gestured towards the entrance of the building, the Bremner, she called the second uh, slide please. with affirmation and vigor. Nama kubi 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 no. Everyone responds. See ya ya. See ya ya. See ya ya. No ma. And it's gone. Okay. They gesture like candles and the performance began. The singing, the ululation and clapping, and the dancing entered full swing. Chumani Makwele, the pioneer figure of the protest, took over from Tando, and he called. Amandla, the more than 40 students present at the time, responded, Awetu, which means power for the people. 
an old camp shrine in South Africa. Then it started with what seemed like a militarized dance step in a street temple call and response format, and I'll demonstrate. Down, rose, down, down. Can we just try to get our parts? You say down. Down, rose, down, down. Down, rose, down. Down, rose, down. Down. Down, down. down. So it went on like that for a while. It was a militarized movement, not in the class of what we just did. The food stamping and ululation was so heavy that it caused almost caused rage, and the building itself was already overwhelmed with a, with loud noise and expression. A condition that shapes okay, uh, the singing, ululation, and dancing continue. Students rage over the long standing as oppression and financial exclusion that rural statue embodies. A condition that have shaped their lives for over 20 years after the demise of apartheid. The UCT management, which had been in a meeting, eventually came out of the building. The singing, ululation, and performance not only disrupted the management meeting, but also compelled the VC and the management to listen to demand. This subtle yet aggressive music-centered protest was one of the definitive phase of the activities of two important movements in post-1994 South Africa. This event also laid and shaped, laid the foundation and shaped uh, the trajectory of my own research as I began to think about the political economy of music in everyday life in Africa. I was interested in ways in which music making shaped social, political, and economic relations. As such, I participated in protest making and conducted interviews, as well as followed the protest across social media for almost two to three years. Mm -hmm. Next one. Okay. Next one. Do you want to Next one. Okay. So the uprising shaped my own research as well. And by uh, July 2017, <coughs> My research has reached a definitive stage and was already popular uh, among students, leaders, and as well as uh, ma middle management of University of Stellenbosch, as well as uh, University of uh, Cape Town. On many occasions, I get invited by students and units and unit heads at the University of Stellenbosch to present my work as part of the university's engagement with issues around decolonization and transformation. In one of the meetings posted by the protesters, I asked one of the leaders of the movement at UCT, Alexi, if she remember how the singing at Bremner on 20th of March 2015 disrupted the school council meeting. She busted into laughter and she looked at me and said, Wena, you remember? Oh, that's interesting of you, she exclaimed. Then she said, when, when we sing, everyone hears. She asserted with conviction and with, uh, with seriousness. Then she went on. They can't ignore us when we sing. Even the government cannot ignore us. She further explained. Alexis aphorism, aphorism that when we sing, everyone hears, to which I will later return, does not only reference music making, it, also, it is also a metaphor for speaking up. Rather than an appendage to protest action, Alexis's statement invokes music making as the de facto of protest. In fact, the significance of Alexis's statement transcends the borders of South Africa. It stretches into the history of protest, social unrest, and processes of social and political development, albeit positive or otherwise, in the African post colony. Next slide. Protest and activism in the African post-colonial has been, has been widely studied with diverse perspectives. And um, 
Next slide, please. Therefore, the history of process, like, like we all know, is, is quite uh, is a long-standing one in, uh, in Africa, even in pre-colonial Africa. And the work on process is quite huge already. But this particular work has been, I've been in conversation with this work in the, uh, in the last few years. They are quite uh, relevant to some of the issues I am working on. So, uh, Shaba Patrick, uh, Mwana uh, Asebaya, of course, uh, is one of the experts in political form of everyday life in Africa. Then also Francis Inyamjo, who is, who is also or, or my professor and one of our mentors at UCT. Then Okeo Alexis. So this, this work up in, in the group, uh, they've actually shaped my own thinking about ideas uh, of protest and forms of protest, particularly the ways in which the idea of protest has gone beyond physical manifestation, traveling or moving into the social media space and different forms of becoming that are digitally mediated. So this is, uh, these are some of the a uh, conversation that my own work is engaging currently. Um, however, a latest statement raises a new question. Then the question is, what might it mean to explore protest and the violence of change? And the violence or change it facilitates as woman-centered music activity. In exploring this question, uh, in this presentation, I explore the relationship between music making, protest action, and state responses in contemporary Africa. I use John Blacken's music, musical extreme humanity and Christopher Small's concept of musicking to explain this relationship as music-centered dialogue. This dialogue, I suggest, has in many instances provoked social changes in the African post-colonial. In doing so, I draw cases from two recent social movements and protests in Africa. The, the first is Road Must Fall, which I just sampled now, and in South Africa, and the second is the end hashtag NSAS protest in Nigeria. The, Rose Must, the hashtag Road Must Fall uh, and NSAS movement have been the two significant social movements that have gained global attention at least in the last seven years in Africa. The Rose Must Fall movement originated in South Africa and called for removal of the colonial status and symbol, particularly that of, uh, that of John Cecil Rhodes at the University of Cape Town. This movement sparked a wider conversation about decolonization, uh, decolonized education and society in South Africa. On the other hand, the hashtag NSAS movement emerged in Nigeria and demanded the disband, disbandment of a problematic police unit and called for an end to police brutality and corruption in Nigeria. Both movements shared a common goal of challenging systemic oppression and advancing and advancing uh, a form, a new model of social justice. In exploring this dynamic, I'm drawing on two important theoretical lines. The first is um, Victor Turner's 1977 and 1985 uh, uh, concept of performance and social drama. Uh, Victor Turner is one of those who championed the idea of anthropology of drama and rituals in the late 70s. So uh, for Turner, Turner explained conflict. He explained conflict and social life as drama. In other words, social crises for Turner are performances of unequal subjectivity among social agents, what the French sociologist uh, Baudetaire has called asymmetric power relations. To put it differently, social change, Turner had it, is an unending process of tension and relief. This unending process of tension and relief in the context of NSAT and Rose Must Fall are musically framed social dialogue. The second is John Blackens' musically framed humanity, what he called our music is man, that is music as a structuring structure, and I quote, can we move? Okay, just a little bit. Yeah. 
for Latin, music is not a language that describes the way society seems to be, to be, but a metaphorical expression of feelings associated with the way society really is. The chief function of music in society and culture is to promote soundly organized humanity by an anti-human consciousness, end quote. I propose that music, music making process and the state police violent suppression of protesters are musically framed rituals, what I hear called musicking. Christopher Smalls defined music in art. Next slide, please. For Christopher Small, so music is to take part in any capacity in any musical performance. That means not only perform, but also listen. That is, music is not only perform, but also listen to provide material for performance, what he calls composing on your one hand, preparing for a performance, and what he calls practicing or rehearsing, or to take part in any activity that can affect the that can affect the nature of that style of human encounter, which is a musical performance. I offer it to you now, the verb to music with its, uh, its present participle music in, as a genuine term for understanding the nature of the music, of the music art and its function in human life. As we all know, uh, Christopher Small's conception is, uh, is quite uh, popular now, and it has contributed uh, uh, in immensely to the discourse around uh, uh, cultural musicology, particularly since the 1990s. My work aims to expand Small's definition by opening the conception of music beyond the musical ecosystem. Through the cases explored in this presentation, music is understood as social dialogue or conversation that shape the process of change, you may call it development, in the African post-colony. In what follows, I have planned crucial moments in the two movements, particularly the Rosemont's Fall and the Enstars. Following that, I, I outline their effects in both countries. Then I explain my conception of music. In. This one. Around 12 p.m. on March uh, 2015, one of uh, UCC's of Cape Town undergraduate stu student called Chumani Makweli, an undergraduate student, stepped out dressed in a more stylish township or community way and threw women experiments, next slide, at this a statue of Sefi John Rhodes, the British imperialist, which is uh, strategically located or sitting comfortably at the upper campus of the University of Cape Town. In a bid to present what he called the reality of black life in the township, Matwelly had done a pin construction hat with a whistle in his mouth, a drum and a placard hung on his neck with inscription exhibit white arrogance at this evening. In his recent interview, Truman McQuarrie explained, reflected on the event, and I quote, next slide please. Black students and academics alike are compelled to forge their identities and career trajectories in a space that does not understand their existence. We are yet to know what, may, what it means to be fully and proudly Black at UCT. Many Black people are, are forced to live without proper sanitation, including toilets. In the Western Cape, the government introduced the bucket system for people in informal settlements and townships. We grew up in this condition. We have lived with sheep for the most part of our life. We are sheep, and sheep is us. And for Chumani, it was crucial to connect his protest to the everyday struggle and human indignity experienced by Black people in the township. 
and a sporting woman excrement from Kailicia is community. So the campus was an attempt to make that connection visible. Many who are familiar with the material with the, with the materiality of who in the post-colonial African policies, we agree with Chumani's action. And also that Chumani's action is not the first in that history to uh, uh, move in that direction. Who or shit, as it is called in many African societies, represents a crucial component of everyday life in the post-colony. It is, in fact, one of the things that defies racial and class hierarchy. It is a unified character of humanity and also a weapon in the hands of the powerful and the powerless. Uh, as you can see on the slide, the Nigerian activist and musician, Fela Anikola Wafuti, once dedicated an album in 1975 to the narrative of sheets, what he calls expensive sheets. As, as one Nigerian business magnate, Otumba Gaddafi put it, sheets is a serious business. This was also true for Black people across South African townships. Following the, following the transition from apartheid to democratic South Africa in 1994, the term transformation became a signifier, a signifier for the promise of a new beginning and a better living condition for people. However, in nearly two decades, the ambiguity of transformation and the policies of representation among the new black politicians and elites who only pay lip service to real transformation, win and weaken as well as overwhelm the hope of many historically, historically disadvantaged South Africans. But the social and economic component or conditions of many Black people grew from bad to worse. Next slide, please. Chomani's full protest was equally a frustration of the continuous encounters of what he called symbol of white supremacy and Black subjugation and oppression on campus. For him, the symbol of Cecil Rhodes was a validation and a physical reminder of his predicament as black person at UCT. And I quote, yes. experience of someone who was born in poverty, someone who learned from early, who learned from early in life that the existence and survival of black people in, the, in, the, in this world comes with a lot of pain and suffering. I quickly learned that despite one's social status, UCC is not a space where you can wake up one morning and feel like you belong as a black person. There are always going to be things that remind you of just how much of an outsider you are. Such things can be in a form of rejection in social cycles and failure to understand and identify with context in the curriculum and study materials. For me, my daily reminder was the status of Ceci John Rhodes. You see the lecturers, lecture hall, seminar room, and staff room, and staff meeting rooms, and the university's indifference to Rhodes' historical legacy of violence and brutality against Black people in South Africa were deeply symbolized by the statue of Rhodes erected at a, at a prime location in the university. Close. Though apartheid is long gone, many historical, uh, historically disadvantaged South Africans still encounter its remnants daily. A few minutes after Chumani's solo protest performance, other students joined. Next slide, please. They joined the drumming, singing, and dancing at the spot. Next slide. This was the birth of the hashtag Rose Must Fall movement. The movement spread like wildfire across universities, generating political discourse and demand for the removal of colonial cities across South Africa as well as across the world. It happened also in the US, no, in, the, uh, in London, particularly Oxford University, and other spaces also, other black communities who also rose in solidarity. I'm sure you remember the story, the popular story, so I won't waste your time. But let's move to the next one. On April 9, yeah, on April 9, 2015, let's move to the next one. 
after a month, a month after Chumani's solo coup process, the photo was removed from the university campus amid jubilation, singing, and dancing. Says the road fell, but the economic and social exclusion that the students claimed it represented remained. Following the success of the Rose Must Fall movement, the Peace Must Fall movement emerged from the from the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg in that same in the October of that same year. Central to the agenda next one, of the Peace Must Fall movement was a reduction in university tuition fee and the transformation of higher education to make it more accessible and equitable for Black people. The movement called for free decolonized education that would provide education to Black South Africans. The movement believed that free decolonized education will, re will remove barriers that, present, that prevent marginalized communities from pursuing higher education. The Peace Must Fall movement protest also spread to other universities across South Africa. And between October 2015 and 2016, it forms the historic shutdown of higher education institutions across South Africa. The issues raised by the two movements, year after, next slide, referred to as the police movement, next slide. These issues are transgenerational sentiment and, and economic frustration among historically disadvantaged students. At the heart of their sentiment and campaign lay deep rooted issues like race land, decolonization, white privilege, gender equality, representation, and notions of Black South African nationhood. And now move quickly to the other context in Nigeria, the NSAS movement. Next slide, please. Let's play. <laughs> what the performance you uh we just watched actually happened two weeks ago for the first time in post-1999 nigeria young women and men turned out in mass to vote out career politicians some of whom have been in government for more than 40 years they turned out to vote for a new nigeria where justice equality and equity reign. It is difficult to conclude if what seems like an ongoing victory for the young men and women of Nigeria will last. This is because the election period is not over. Nigeria is currently on with uh, its um, national election. So two weeks ago, Nigeria had its um, presidential election. These are the three candidates. The man, the first person, Peter Obi, uh, the vote, Labour Party, one, two, Labour Party, 93, is actually for him. Obi, out of the three candidates, Obi is more, uh, I, I would like to put is what we can call the saint in, in essence, because according to people, they also believe there is no. Uh, Three politicians, all politicians are almost the same. But the youth find alliance with Obi and they promoted his candidacy. But what is important about this story, which is quite popular now, is that for the first time, youth came out in March to, to vote. It has never it hasn't it doesn't been like that in the last 20 years. Why? Because the politicians themselves have created an, a structure that tends to distract the youth from mainstream politics. Youth are not used to mainstream politics. 
Red and mainstream politics, they are used to fashion, they are used to hard, they want to do music, and things around enjoyment and quote. So these are the alternative structures sponsored by the Nigerian state to keep the youth focused on one area. Why did the politicians focus on other aspects of the nation? But what seems like a reality two weeks ago, Nigerians attempted what seemed impossible five years before now. They voted out pioneering of political parties in many states. Most embarrassing of all was the victory of the Labour Party in Lagos, the powerhouse of the All People Pro uh, Congress, the APC, the ruling party of Nigeria. Now, in this three uh, photograph we see on them, the man in between, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, has been one of the uh, strategies for the APC party for uh, in the last, let's say, eight years of his, or uh, seven years. The current president, he was the one, is popular as a kingmaker. And Lagos has been his base. So since he became, he entered the political space at least 20 years ago, Lagos has never, uh, you know, lost an, uh, lost an election to an opponent. It has always been a win win battle for Lagos. But for the first time, what a root shock. The youth turned out in mass and voted. Lagos out and reclaim Lagos for almost an unknown party. The OB party only came into existence uh, May 2022. And it's quite surprising that within less than a year, the movement rally ran an unknown politician for that matter, who was said to have no structure and voted in en mass and won Lagos and Abuja, the federal capital. The question is, why does it why does it take this category of Nigerians to so long to achieve this feat? Why haven't they done this in 20 years, 20 years ago? Why haven't they done done it, let's say, in 10 or 5 years ago? I explore this question through a kind of, uh, a run, a kind of outline of a situation that happened in 2020, now popular as the hashtag NSAS protest. The hashtag next slide. The hashtag NSAS protest took, shook Nigeria and its various establishments to the core and have been accredited with waking up young people who are politically aware but not necessarily engaged in partisan politics. Anti robbery squad, SATS, a unit of the Nigerian police force accused of extrajudicial killing torture and other forms of human rights abuse was central to the activity and the protest of the hashtag answers. And we play the next slide. So that is an, a, that's, that's a typical, a practical example of what SARS represents. It will, uh, the SARS are popular, the SARS is popular for judicial killing, torture, uh, and what they call police brutality. So they are often, they, their target is more or less young Nigerians who have been their victims for, uh, on many occasions. And this was the context that shaped the mass movement or youth protests called now known as NSAS. It started, the NSAS started in the first week of October 2020, and for more than two weeks, demonstrations took place across the country on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, with the hashtag NSAS. It happened both in Nigeria and across, uh, both in Lagos and across Nigeria, as well as beyond the borders of Nigeria, like places like New York, London, and Canada. What are they calling for? They were calling for an end to controversial to the SARS, which I said earlier, renowned for abuse and extrajudicial killings, and all sorts of uh, uh, everyday harassment of Nigerians. The slogan, Sorosuke, a word in Yoruba language that uh, means speak out, or speak louder, or speak up or make yourself hard. It came uh, 
the uh, slogan or central to the answers of our project. Let's move to the next slide. So I was explaining earlier, the huge came out in NMAS for the period, and for the first time also, they came together to work for a unified purpose, calling for the end of NSAS. So Sorosuke indexes the struggle of young Nigerians to make their voice heard amid the overwhelming social, political, and economic injustice that shape everyday life of the common people in Nigeria. Next slide. Let's take So that is our answer, and that was that that is what it was like uh, mm -hmm. during the period. It was a huge festival, a festival of eating, drinking, and merriment that took place across Nigeria and beyond also. However, uh, their demand they placed the uh, layers demand, but here I just I outline uh, just four or five of them. The first one is that justice uh, for all people who, who died through po of police brutality in the past and appropriate compensation to their families this is what this, this uh, is the first demand and the second demand uh, an independent body to that for the Nigerian government to choose an independent body to investigate and prosecute all reports or complaints of police brutality within 10 days that was, I think that was the <laughs> Then the next one was independent psychological evaluation and training, the training of the abandoned staff officers before they can be redeployed. Then the last one here yeah, is uh, that the government should provide adequate increase, increase in the salaries of officers of the Nigerian police force as appropriate incentive for carrying out their constitutional duty of protecting lives and properties in Nigeria. The Nigerian government responded to the demand by setting up a committee uh, that is called Presidential Panel on Police Reform and eventually promised to approve the demand following the approval of Mohamed Adamu, the Inspector, of, the Inspector General of uh, Police, IGP. The IGP also announced a replacement uh, uh, of the ENSAC, Christine Special Weapon and Tactics SWAT team as a replacement for SAC. In spite of government response and promises of police reform, the protests increased with intensity and demand. This is because there is a history of distrust between the government and Nigerians, particularly young Nigerians. For example, the protesters wanted immediate action on the implementation of the demands of their demands, citing government's past failures to deliver on promises of justice and social economic equality. With renewed energy, the protest spread and became one of the biggest festivals and gatherings of young Nigerians, both in Nigeria and in the diaspora, vying for common and unified objectives. It seems that young people have finally discovered their voice, and everyone who needs to be heard is hearing at the time. They have. In other words, they have sorosoke, that is to speak loud, through songs, dance, and forms of of uh, music and conviviality that tends to recenter power from the authoritarian government to the hands of the young people from the periphery. This generation of young Nigerians did not only make history, they were determined to rewrite their own story in the Nigerian project. The hashtag NSAS protest was the first young people led mass movement with unified objective against the Nigerian state after the 1978 Ali Mosgo protest. Mosul, the protest was beyond police brutality. It was about political and constitutional reform. For the protesters, SARS is a reflection of the long-standing systemic decadence and corruption among Nigerian politicians. 
Therefore, police brutality is symbolic and, a, and an emb embodiment of the draconian and authoritarian rule of the government. So, the protesters introduced additional hashtags on social media and on placards and protest venues, such as end bad government, end corruption, end insecurity in Nigeria. Despite several attempts, the Nigerian government could not alter or stop the protest. This was possible because the NSAS protest had no leader or representative speaking for the movement. The protest took place in simultaneously across cities, online blogs, online news, what we call fake news like, and social media platforms. Both Lekki, but Lekki Toge the, became the epicenter uh, of the movement. The NSAS movement became a mystery to the Nigerian political elite and the government. The protest came to an end, unfortunately, through a bloody massacre when some members of the Nigerian army opened fire on peaceful protesters at the Lekito Gate. At around 7 p.m. on October 2020, the protester being massacred held the Nigerian flag in it. Held the Nigerian flag, I'm coming. Fuck you! Let him shoot, let him shoot. Everyone sit down, sit down, sit down. Okay. The protesters held the Nigerian flag and they were singing as they sang the national anthem of their country. They were also recording and broadcasting their own massacre to the world via Facebook Live and Instagram Live. In the following day, hoodlums and thugs, said to be sponsored by the political elite, infiltrated the protest and destroyed government property in Lagos and across Nigeria. This was said to have been organized by the government to cover off the bloody massacre of its young citizens. However, the government disbanded SAR but denied the shooting took place at the project. The government also argued that there was no death. That is still an ongoing case in Nigeria. I now return to my, my idea of music. In. So from the two case studies, there are, there are two, the two important key points here. Uh, the, when we sing every one year, to sing, as Alexis put it, is to speak against oppression while also expressing frustration and impatience with structures of power. The slogan, on the other one, the slogan Sorosuke of the NSAT movement also fulfilled the same goal. But statements call attention, both statements call attention to ways in which young people are speaking up and calling out for alternative mode of becoming. In these two aphorisms, life or statement, lies the deep-rooted problematic history of oppression and repression in many societies in the African post-colony. The Cameroonian philosopher and social theorist, Achille Mbembe, has argued that the African post-colony is marked by continuation of the unequal power relation and exploitation that characterize the colonial era. For Achille Mbembe, violence and death are being used as tools of political control and economic exploitation. Mbembe explained this, explained this shared social condition of the post-colony as necropolitics. Next slide. And I quote, I have put forward the notion of necro necropolitics account to account for the various ways in which, in our contemporary world, weapons are deployed in the interest of maximally destroying persons and creating dead wars. That is, 
the new and unique form of social existence in which vast populations are subjected to living conditions that confer upon them the status of the living dead, end quote. The living dead in, B in, in Bembe's framing is the suppressed, oppressed, and dehumanized body whose agency has been submerged by an authoritarian government or state power. The living dead have, have no political will to speak. The living dead has no will or neither could he question the injustice of the government. If the police movement and the ANSAS protest resisted necropolitics by cultivating alternative mode of living and creating new forms of solidarity and community. For example, the hashtag on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and WhatsApp constituted alternative spaces and structures within which the agenda of the two movements tried. As the two movements shows, to live or to be alive amidst necropolitics is to be had through musical stage protest and social activism. Then the question is, the next slide please, how does musical performance invoke violence? By performance here, I mean singing, dancing, the artworks, self-fashioning, arts, and the technological uh, mediation that shape protests in both uh, countries, both in Nigeria and in South Africa. So I outline a few of these uh, dynamics and I will conclude with my uh, point on music. First, protesters demand were often expressed through musical performances. In order to protect their interests and public property, the state power or authority will respond with force through the imposition of militarized atmosphere that work against the immediate interests of the protesters and the legitimacy of their action. Collective musical performances, singing and dancing represented the collective voice of the protesters why the response of the law enforcement agency represented the voice of the authority. Um, let's see the next thing. slide. Yeah, so let's go back to the next one. So the first, the picture on the slide, for instance, uh, this is one of the pictures of the peace must fall in 2016. This is Johannesburg. This is Bram Fountain in Johannesburg. So the point about music in is that, and the ways in which I'm trying to conceptualize to expand the ideas of music in of uh, 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 Small is simply to see beyond the singing itself, to also look into, into the conversation, what I call dialogue. In the, the idea of dialogue here simply means uh, I'm drawing from the music characters even of the African descent or uh, African people, the idea of call and response. So the first stage is when the protesters call. How did they call? They make their call by making known their own intention, like what they did, submitting a demand and staging a concert or protesting, singing around. That is the call. Then in order to protect their own interests, the state, the authority, would always find ways to mitigate or find ways to crush. That is what actually Mbembe called necropolitics, that is to the living dead. In many African nations or, or societies, the idea of necropolitics is a common, is, is, is a common uh, character or common characteristic of society. Many people walk on the street, but they are dead as, as actually theorizing. Because why are they dead living? It's simply because they had no agency. Their agency has been submerged by political conditions or, or social or socioeconomic conditions in their society. Then the next point is the interplay between these two groups, which I call dialogue, created, often creates tension that would often that will result in violence. And such violence, I hold, 
became a force that animated social change or transformation in the African post colony. I will explain this further. Come, let's move to the next slide. I will unpack that. Then the question is uh, why are protesters violent? And what is the role of music in this process? The first point here is that the content of the song and dances embodied historical trauma. They are forms of remembering. They are social archives. They are what we call as theorized somewhere as archaeology of the mind. They are ways in which people think about themselves. They are ways in which people see the past, even when they are not there. And in essence, it propelled the anger, songs propelled anger that that will often lead to vandalism or rage. For example, many of the songs performed by the police movement are songs of the revolution that were rendered, that were performed in the 80s. They were anti-apartheid songs. And these songs are archives of trauma and transgenerational uh, history and memory. A case in point is a popular song called Eo Solomon. Can you take the next slide? Fuck you! No? Okay. So, the song uh, is called Iyo Solomon. It's actually dedicated, or what we can explain as um, a sphere where an hero is being, I would like to the song is actually the archive through which the legacy of Solomon Matangu is no. All right, through which his legacy is preserved. Yes, that's what. Yes. Yeah. So Solomon Mantlangu uh, was one of the Nkunto uh, Sizwe soldier who, who was killed in the 80s. He was 23 years old. And he was killed by the apartheid government in a, in a serious, in a bloody uh, massacre, just like Stephen people. So the song invoked the iconic figure of Solomon Mantlangu, who was killed. In the 80s, it was one Solomon was one of the uh, ANC military hands that was trained in Zimbabwe and Tanzania and other areas. Before his execution, he hold his mother and he said, My blood will not nourish the tree that will bear the fruit of freedom. Tell my people, tell my people that I love them. They must continue the fight. In 2015, from the Rose Must Fall, yes, the South African youth actually continued the fight. Solomon song, that Solomon, your Solomon, became the anthem of the anti-apartheid revolution and also became uh, an iconic figure of the police movement. So the point is, any time the song is performed, people get furious because the song transports them to that moment of Solomon's death, and they do so, they, they simply do what he asked them to do, that is to keep fighting because of their life. Let's play the next slide. <laughs> So 
So what this is what we call um toy toy. Toy toy was one of the uh performance that was also learned in Zimbabwe in the 80s. So it was uh, one of the resources that was borrowed from Zimbabwe and it became uh, a crucial component in South Africa. Of, as we speak, anytime, to, as we speak, students are protesting actually. This is much thought. So the protest has become what uh, Victor Turner called liminality. So, Protest is part of the way in which students negotiate themselves, refresh their own identity, or reassert their own space in South Africa. And one of the ways that people get to hear them, or the government, it could be school or any company, is through forms like this. When they write, it's possible that uh, people don't listen or they read the letter, but whenever the song is staged as uh, Alexis uh, claimed, people listen to them. So the content of songs and dance embodied historical trauma and suffering and ends propel the anger that led to act, uh, act of vandalism or violence in the press of uh, in the protest action. It has both positive and negative effects though. It's Negative effects, including uh, death, like in the case of Nigeria, where the police opened fire after uh, the government had asked the protesters to stop. But unfortunately, the police went there to respond on behalf of the state, and they killed many people. Though the government denied it, but it is there on record. Also, many higher institutions of learning in the state of South Africa were shut down for many days. In 2016, and as we speak, many institutions are also shut because it is every year it has be, is becoming a festival. This idea of music, so it is one of the ways people get to negotiate privilege. So if people don't protect, sometimes they don't get hurt. So on that note, um, Alexis was uh, perhaps speaking for the future of. Is our uh, uh, assertion was prophetic in the sense that what she said in 2017 is now becoming the every year performance. Every February, March, students protest to get registered and to get funding. Then, in some, I read this. I read this dialogue as negotiation. I suggest this negotiation. I suggest this negotiation. Through the agency of music becomes music in. I do not consider music in and of itself to express or mean violence. A small hardy, musical works exist in order to give performance something, performance something to perform. Therefore, I like this statement that when we sing everyone here and the answer slogan, Sorosoke, that is to speak out. They are mechanism through which the two movements call attention and facilitate order in negotiating for power. Order in this sense references uh, Jack Attali's ideas of noise. So order in this sense is a process through which performance takes place. And music can provide a theoretical lens to start thinking about protest not as a negative entity or what we can call a uh, violent, but as a dialogue through which society changes from one state to the other. And like the slogan uh, uh, states, Sorosuke, and in the case of Alexis, to, to speak loud is to contest necropolitics. And the process of contesting is to reassert oneself. And to reassert oneself, in the in the face of authoritarian rule is to call for a performance such performances in most cases have implications both negative and positive but what's important to my own research and my own argument is not about the product as it said but about the process and what this process can tell us about social change what can it tell us about social or political dynamics like in the Nigerian case, 
the, the Sorosuke generation or the NSAS uh, movement are currently renegotiating their own story in the Nigerian space. The next election is coming on the 18th of March. Across social media space, there are forms of campaign. There are forms via, including hashtags, performances, music, and forms of comedy in which they have created a new order to negotiate or to create a, an, a substitute or alternative way of contesting or reasserting themselves. This process is what I am suggesting or what I'm trying to write or to conceptualize as music. I think I'll stop there now. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, shall we open the floor for questions and comments? Would you like to start? I have a question. I don't know if this question is theoretical or ethnomusicologist, but I find it easy to agree that singing and music inspire solidarity and may even inspire bravery. But is the precise nature of the sound important? Or is it simply singing together that is important? Mm. Okay, thank you so much. Well, <clears throat> let's. I think we should go back to um, John Blacken's conceptualization of how music is man. So, the point in the case of Blacken is not about the music itself. Also, um, Christopher Small shares the same argument for small, it's not about the music, it's not about the music for woman, but the music. It's not about, it's not, the performer is not created for the music. The music is created for the performer. So he uses the, the word performer in the uh, borrowing idea also from uh, Victor Turner. So the idea is to perform, but to, to perform, there's need for something to propel. So music in this sense, whatever it is, it could be Bach, Beethoven, it could be a popular music from, uh, uh, Lagos or Sarah, it could be a protest song. So what's important is that it's invoking something. And again, this brings us to the idea of protest song. So one of the dynamics there is that, like from what you're saying, there is no music. I don't think there's a music intentionally read composed for protest. Yeah. So the idea is music speaks to condition, context. People, people draw on music to respond to a particular situation. It could be a church hymn. In South Africa, uh, Zenzinani is a church hymn, but it is it's one of the uh, revolutionary uh, uh, protest uh, repertoire in South Africa. So the point is that it's, it's not really about what the song is. It's about the context that is activating. Yeah. And why they chose to use that particular song at the time is also very important. It just makes me wonder, though, if there are some sounds that are more dialogic than others, if there are some sounds that inspire dialogue more than other sounds. Okay. I agree with you. Yeah. Well, in the case of protest or revolution, as these two cases suggest, um, Let's use South Africa as a case and I'll go back to Lagos quickly. In the South African context, there are standardized repertoires for protests. Yeah, that's one. But these songs were initially composed as for community engagement. It could be for church. Most of the songs are written from church. Uh, and, I, and this brings to mind the works of um, Marie Jorisma, uh, the Stony Cape of Karoo. So these are aims of colored people. But when it's time for them to negotiate something, they draw on this repertoire. So the point is, the music is there, but the human body confer agency on the music at a particular time. Like the video I show in the case of Lagos, the music they were playing, they, these are club music. They are forms of the new emerging Afrobeats. But at the time of protest, so they confer another meaning on this song. So they become a kind of communication tool. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you. No questions, comments? Um, if I can ask, uh, so something I was thinking about uh, with the case of NSARS and you talking about, um, I was really struck when you were showing the list of um, demands that uh, people were making of the government. Um, and I was thinking of it in comparison with uh, Black Lives Matter and abolitionist activism in the US. Um, it really struck me that a lot of what it seemed like was being um, asked for was maybe reallocating the funding for police to like different things, restructuring the police force rather than um, you know, in the U.S., we're hearing so much about defunding police and stuff like that. I'm just curious if, um, if that's if that's the case, or if, if that's if you're encountering folks who are talking about maybe abolishing police forces or things. You know, they abolished SARS, but they created a new police force. They're talking about creating a new SWAT team, right? So it's it's almost like there's more funding going into policing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if that if that's a conversation you've seen coming up in that context or not. Definitely, it's about power relations. That is where the idea of conversation dialogue is coming in. So it both it uh, it uh it's about direct and indirect communication. So they place demand. We want one, two, three, four, five. So for government delivering the demand is going to weaken their own position. So rather than creating following the demand strictly, what it did was okay. Thank you. We are, rather than using the SARS, we are going to say yes to you. We are going to clear the SARS off. We're going to create alternative body. So the question is that it's more like transformation. Yeah. So the O is still part of it. And what is also important is the new, the new does not necessarily, uh, in terms of performance, might not really be a new component because it is just a change of name. And definitely, it is going to reproduce what used to be. And that was where this uh, disbelief or skepticism of youth uh, came in, telling the government, no, we're not going to do this. So it's about political agenda. The government had, it, uh, had a clear understanding of the fact that removing SARS on the road is to remove their own power. So the SARS is not a new thing in the history. Is part of the ways in which the government speak and asserts their power. Yeah. Thank you. I think you make a really strong point for the importance of humanities in the larger context of how it conveys meaning and draws people to action of one sort or another. This morning on National Public Radio, you might have a chance to hear it, but there was a discussion of the North Mississippi Delta and interviews of people who are who are founders of the blues lead belly uh bb king and the way their music expressed not so much specific political action but a lament about the condition the human condition in that that human experience and so the blues plays very much to what you're talking about but it's not specific just saying that the conditions that we're living with are lamentable and it conveys a sense of of uh, Lack of empowerment, but it wasn't around political, certain political themes. It was about the music being attractive to a local audience and then a national, international audience. This is all the way from Lead Belly to B.B. King, the people we associate with fantastic music, the blues, and then sort of transforming into forms of jazz. So um, it's really an endorsement of what you're doing. And thank you for that. I think the humanities are a critical part of what we do, what we ought to be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was fascinated that you picked two quite disparate movements, countries far separated, um, as your case study. And I was wondering, in the uh, in the question of dialogue, do you see dialogue between these two different countries and two different movements? Are there any sort of communication? Is there echo? Okay. Are things taken up? I, I mean, there are different musical traditions too, um, but maybe similar protest movements. What do you think? Wow. Well, thank you so much for the question. I was expecting that. Well, um, to start with, the African countries, I think I explained, uh, I explained that briefly. Um, 
I'm sure you know about this established conversation around homogeneous African culture and the heterogeneous African culture. We have that in uh, ethnomusicological debate over the years has been around. So the point is, is um, sure, there are connections. And in fact, the more visible connections we have now is the youth culture. Yeah. And digital uh, technology is bridging that differences right now. So, in fact, not only with between Nigeria and South Africa, it's also between the, what we now call the global African citizens, the new Africans. It could be from Lagos to Nairobi to Kinshasa to Cape Town. So there's this global culture of Africa that technology allows, you know, and mediate also through not just about protest music. I'm sure you've seen about Afrobeats, the reimagination of uh, uh, American rap and uh, rap culture and hip hop in the African sense, which Nigeria is trying to dominate now. So that is one. Oh, so the Nigeria tries to dominate anything. <laughs> so the dialogue is ongoing. The dialogue is, is always there. Definite dialogue is there. And the way it has always been around, but the ways in which it is uh, being redefined recently is coming up in a new dimension and more intensified than what it used to be. And thank you, technology, for that. So to summarize. There's another deep, deeper <laughs> layer to that, which is um, the shared political connection I spoke about, which Aslim Ashilimbem they talk about necropolitics. So I, I, uh, I might not necessarily agree with Achille that um, the colonial culture is being is dictating the post-colonial life. I might not necessarily agree with that. But what is visible and what is position is pointing us to is simply that for us to see a kind of reproduction of certain uh, draconian uh, nature of the colonial life, which the African elite of the post-independence era inherited. And that can bring, take us back to what you said, the idea of uh, cultural reproduction. So it is normal for the African states to reproduce because they have no structure. They borrowed this, the nation state project is not an African project. Yeah, from the 19th century, the nation state project is a part of the Western modernity, which found its way to Africa through colonial encounters. So definitely, Africa is going to reproduce that kind of structure. Yeah, so that, so that is the sheer dynamics there. It's about, uh, and if you notice, every post-colonial state after 20 years, they get into crisis. <laughs> South Africa started having serious crisis after 20 years. Nigeria had the same. In fact, Nigeria did not even wait 20 years. Six years, the first coup. Ghana did not wait. And if you notice, in the first 10 years of independence or 20 years of independence, most African countries are still a bit balanced. But by 15, 20 years, they are going to what South Africa is today. So, I hope South Africa will not get to Nigerian state in the next 50 years or 30 years. So that's the point. It's, it's, that's the, tra uh, the trajectory. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm afraid we're near the end of our time, but maybe we should take one more question. Are there questions online? We did have a question online. Uh, I, yeah, I see I see Bola has a question too. Uh, maybe Bola, go ahead and then um, right. Dan Reed has a question for you, but maybe um, we can speak about prison in Indiana. <laughs> okay. It's a good question. Uh, Go ahead, Bola. Yeah, no, thanks for this you know, presentation, um, um, Dr. Ayurubi. Um, for me, I, I'm kind of interested in the idea of music as social, you know, as, a, as an instrument of social ordering as pertaining to, you know, these two movements. In other words, that, you know, which is things that you've spoken about, but that music, you know, kind of prepares the way for what it, you know, the action that is to take place. For instance, I remember the two songs um, that mostly dominated the NSAS movement um, where um, Africa, China's Mr. President and I Idris Abdukarim's um, Jaga Jaga. And I remember I also participated in one of the protests in Cape Town at the time. And um, 
I tried to get the um, the DJ whom I knew to play Fela's song, but I don't know for whatever reason he, he stuck to these two songs. But the two songs are very effective because the the it was a kind of archive of pain and violence that he kept on you know Produce, producing, yeah. evoking in which the people and it, it was specific to the generation that led the protest in the other words the songs were early 2000s and these were the songs these youths grew up with they knew they sang maybe or maybe not necessarily understanding the context but the at this time uh, where most of them are in their late 30s and 40s they found out that the songs of their childhood and the condition persists. In fact, it even aggravated, you know, um, as being amplified beyond, you know. So this this um, connection between music and social ordering and music as a tool to facilitate whatever social, um, um, you know, um, activity, be it protest or be it any other activity. What, what do you think about that um, relationship. Oh, well, I think what you, uh, yeah, you are right. So the point is songs are stories. So people tell stories about themselves, about they tell stories to console, to express their own story. They tell themselves about themselves, what they are saying. Like Kani Baba explained about popular culture, popular art in Africa that it is it is people creating story for themselves about their shared condition. So when um, Idris Abu Karim wrote Nigeria Jaga Jaga, it was more like reflecting on the, uh, President Olusha Gbagbo's presidency, his first two terms about the way things were working, and also remember that Idris Abu Karim himself is more like. Uh, it, it was part of more like the uh, right wing or I would like it at the time. So he was always talking about more like issues going on. This is not good about our country. So in fact, perhaps I wish I thought he was, you know, would have uh, on, uh, taken the song to be more like an attack on that political party. But the reality about the song is that he was just talking about Nigeria. And he was not the only one doing that, even the Fuji musicians. The Bari Kitty were Ori Regi Regi, you know, what it seems, let's uh, see, a, a, a Nigerian guy called Ogese. I think it was, not, it was the first person that actually started this. Who, who went to London and came back and reflected on the situation of, of the roads in London. And he sang, like, look, if you see, if you we need to experience our, our roads, they are bad, they are this and this. So, and then uh, we had it. With, so, it's about story. It's about the story they tell themselves about their own condition. And if you see, that is what people are also buying. People want to buy because the story speaks to them. But it, it gets to a point when the story moves beyond entertainment sphere to becoming a, a tool of expression, assuming you know, political power. And that's when it finds itself uh, you know, it, it gets staged on the protest ground because it's part of the story they've been telling themselves. And this protest itself is also about their own life. So those songs automatically uh, become valuable to express that conversation. They won't use Bob Marley. They will use on Brad, Bob Marley, but it doesn't fit directly. It is what the guy wrote about Lagos Road, about Portacourt Road. That's the same condition they are vying for, they are protesting for. So that is the song they are going to use. They actually use Fela uh, at some point. In fact, the picture of Fela at the time was um, guys perform. But that was more, that was stronger. It passed the message because the guy belonged to the generation of Sorosuke. So he was talking about his own experience. Fela was talking about his experience in the 70s. Most of those issues were still around. But what the guy said in early 20, uh, to uh, 20,000, where some of the things that emerge, evolve, and develop into what led to answer. So that is, so the songs themselves, they are spheres of thinking. People think they are archives. They want to think about loved ones, the songs that they play the song. 
they need to reflect about the political condition it is the song they go to if they need to celebrate life through big parties it's the same song so you wonder when you see the same song at the uh, new ceremony or wedding the same song you see at the protest ground so this is my approach the music itself has no potency for himself it is people that confirm confer agency on music it is what you call it it is and that is what um, uh Turner, Turner was talking about about public social performances or social drama so but what makes social drama effective is something like music so that's the basic uh, point well, thank you for the uh i think there's someone i think we're over so maybe we're we're over take time. one one last question okay or so do you want to take more no, no, there was, we there, well, there was one question from, from Dan Reed, which is something I was thinking about too, but um, maybe I think we should, probably, we should probably wrap up because we're almost 10 minutes over, but he was just, he was asking about, um, you know, in the dialogue you described in both the cases of South Africa and Nigeria, is the sonic element only on the side of the protesters, or does the state also engage in sonic communication in the negotiation of power? Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, something, something to think about, but we okay. probably are out of time, or we're definitely out of time. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. You've given us a lot to think about and maybe a lot to listen to.